Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my first of two talks about field conservation in Northern Mongolia. I am excited to share my experiences as an emerging conservator training at a field lab and archeological site. An earlier version of this talk was presented in October 2022 at the 48th annual meeting of the Western Association of Art Conservators, which was held where I live in Seattle on the South Salish Sea, where Coast Salish indigenous people have stewarded the land since time immemorial. Here is the roadmap for my talk. I will give context to the site, myself and my colleagues, then share several projects. Then I will briefly introduce my future research about contemporary preventive conservation in Mongolia that will be presented as part two at a future WAC conference. My background is in art history, art making, and computers. I also love to camp and backpack. While earning my master's in art history at the University of Washington in the 2010s, I began seeking career paths related to climate change adaptation that would use my existing skills. Mentors in art history and collections care pointed me to art conservation. Seattle conservator Lisa Duncan became the first of many treasured mentors in this field. To accrue more training hours, I applied to competitive internships and considered pay-to-play archaeological fieldwork opportunities. I am grateful to my friends Mary Johnstone and the late Gus Hartman for supporting me by sharing their surplus frequent flyer miles to help me travel twice to Mongolia for this work. Searching for fieldwork opportunities connected me to Dr. Julia Clark and Nomad Science, which is now a registered nonprofit. Nomad Science Director Julia is on the left. She grew up in Montana and studies early settlement archaeology in Central Asia. Nomad Science brings together international participants and an interdisciplinary team of scientists, drivers, and amazing cooks. On the right is co-director Dr. J. Bayarsaikan or Bayra, a Mongolian archaeologist specializing in Mongolia's Bronze Age. Until 2020, Bayra was head of the National Museum of Mongolia's Research Center and he is currently at the Max Planck Institute in Germany. Bayra brings teams of Mongolian grad students to the field. Nomad Science trains participants in archaeology and supports students on independent research projects, including translation support to carry out ethnographic interviews with herder families who live in the areas where we work. Now let's introduce contemporary Mongolia with these photos from the capital Ulaanbaatar that show contemporary buildings, the Trojan Lama Temple Complex Museum, and the Toll River. The lower left photo is a detail of a mural along the Toll River and shows the contemporary political border of Mongolia in red and the historical extent of the medieval Mongol Empire that existed from 1206 to 1368 in yellow. Contemporary Mongolia is a landlocked country located between China and Russia. From 1691 to 1911, this territory was controlled by China under the Qing Dynasty and referred to as Outer Mongolia. For most of the 20th century, Mongolia was a satellite state of the Soviet Union and became an independent democracy in 1990. A few generations ago, most Mongolians grew up as herders, mobile pastoralists living on the land with herds of animals. In the 21st century, more and more Mongolians are born and raised in cities. The population of Mongolia is 3.28 million. Millions more ethnic Mongolians live in northern China, in territory called Inner Mongolia in the Qing Dynasty era. Mongolian is the shared language of several Mongol ethnic groups. The Seattle region is also home to many Mongolian immigrants, some of whom live here seasonally to escape severe air pollution in Ulaanbaatar in winter. An important location for much of nomad science's work is the Darhad Valley and Hovsgol Aimag. Hovsgol Aimag is named for Lake Hovsgol, a deep, massive lake that flows into Lake Baikal. The regional capital of Hovsgol Aimag is Murun. The city of Murun is our group's last opportunity to purchase supplies in bulk on the way to the field. After Murun, we say farewell to paved roads and drive north over a pass to enter the Darhad Valley, which is located at 1,600 meters elevation between two mountain ranges. It takes at least three days to travel from Ulaanbaatar to our sites in the Darhad. You have probably noticed how green the land is in northern Mongolia. The thin soil is rich in wildflowers and large trees grow on the north slopes of hills and mountains. Weather patterns here are changing rapidly due to climate change. Permafrost is thawing, and herding is becoming even more challenging. Old agreements among the herding families in the area handle where they move their herds for grazing. If you look closely above the red pixels at lower left of the large photograph, you can see a fence running across the image to the right. This fence extends a very long distance to north and south and functions to separate the summer and winter grazing lands. In Mongolia, grazing land is held in common and animals graze freely on the landscape. It is legal to pull over and camp nearly anywhere. 
Mongolian Imogs are further subdivided into sums, and our work takes place in Ulanul Sum. The top two photos are from the Sum Center, and you can see yaks and horses grazing freely in the town. Many families use motorcycles and trucks to get around, as well as horse transportation. The downside to the rains that make this region so green is the mud, and most trips to the fields includes chaining vehicles together at some point to drag one out of the mud or a river. In the lower right photo, note that the Kashmir goats have painted horns, which is among the methods used to communicate ownership when different families' herds mingle. Herder families in the Darhad Valley move several times a year with their animals, packing up their heritage objects and moving through cultural landscapes with prominent archaeological sites. They live in gares, which is the Mongolian word for yurt. Cultural landscapes dating back millennia are prominent features on the Mongolian steppe. The upper left image is a kirigsur, a Bronze Age funerary monument. This example has a circle perimeter. Kirigsur were also made with square perimeters. Kyrgyzstan are associated with carved deerstone monoliths, such as the deerstone in the large image. The lower left image shows a set of ovos at the south portal to the Darkhad Valley. Ovos are monuments constructed from stacked stones or wood arranged in a cone. They are significant to Mongolian folk religions and function similarly to Buddhist stupas. Mongolian Buddhism is historically connected to Tibetan Buddhism and is practiced alongside folk and shamanic traditions. The practice of looting graves for valuable goods dates back millennia and continues in the present day around the world. The degree of looting that has taken place over the last decade in Mongolia is unprecedented. Mongolia has very strong laws protecting antiquities, however with the low population density, enforcement is very difficult. About five years ago, Julia and Baira were investigating a looted Bronze Age site in the Darhad Valley and consulted herders living nearby. The herders advised, if you think that's bad, check out the cemetery on the mountain. The team visited the ridges of Hordig Mountain and encountered a systematically looted medieval cemetery with scattered loose textiles and other artifacts and remains. They did photo documentation and returned during the 2018 and 2019 field season with permits for a salvage excavation to collect what was left and deposit the objects and remains in the National Museum of Mongolia. One of the 2018 participants, a New York City middle school teacher named Bora made this drawing in her field notebook that expresses what we encountered better than a photograph. Hole after hole, each hole surrounded by stones that had once been mounded in large piles atop 800-year-old graves. The medieval, gra medieval graves are distributed along the tree line on the eastern ridges of Horig Mountain, whose name means taboo. We found textiles in amazing condition for their age that had been preserved in permafrost before the looters disturbed the burial environment. In 2018, our team did not include professional conservators, and we handled the textiles to the best of our ability. In 2019, Julia recruited two conservators, and I returned to the field to learn from them and complete the salvage excavation. I mostly worked under Sandra Vanderwarf, an American cultural heritage preservation specialist who had previously done fieldwork with Nomad Science. Sandra earned her graduate degree in textile conservation at FIT, working under Denise Montagut. I was also mentored by Charlotte Parent, a Canadian artifacts conservator trained at Queen's University. When Sandra and Charlotte were at the salvage site, I also received guidance in my lab tasks from Kristen Pearson, an American cultural anthropologist who was then on a Fulbright Fellowship in Mongolia. Charlotte and Kristen stayed for the first three-week session. Due to the volume and significance of artifacts, Baira arranged for National Museum of Mongolia conservator Niamsuren Dojansan to travel to join our field team during the second session. After receiving our final permits at Ulan Ulul Sum Center, we drove onward to a meadow below Horig Mountain and set up camp. We set up a dining tent and three traditional gares to use for kitchen, storage, and lab space. Everyone sleeps in personal tents. Typically, Nomad Science operates from an established campsite 40 minutes away along a river with an outhouse, but it was too far away from Horig to commute given the workload. Our Mongolian colleagues took the lead in setting up the gares. Even for city Mongolians, it is a point of pride to set up the willow lattices, front door, top roundel, and upright posts. The full group participates in setting the roof poles made from larch wood, setting them into slots in the roundel, and attaching to the lattice with leather or cord loops. Huge pieces of wool felt insulate the sides and roof. The roof is also covered with waterproof tarps, and then a cotton cover is secured over the complete gear. The roundel can be open for light and is closed with felt during rain and at night.
Our kitchen gear had a vinyl floor, the other gears had earth floors. Here is a view of the kitchen, showing how to roll up the wall felts for ventilation on hot days. Our conservation lab gear is on the far right, the large gear on the left is the kitchen, and the center gear was used for food storage, overflow lab space, and drying personal gear on rainy days. In this stage photo of Sandra, Charlotte, and I at work, I invite you to note how we use the ceiling and sides of the gear to store items and attach small USB lights to the upright poles. The workbench tops are part of Nomad Science's equipment and reused yearly. The posts for benches are sourced from deadfall trees and later used for firewood. I created this graphic in June of 2022 to support an emerging Mongolian conservator and recent graduate of a conservation program in Japan who joined Nomad Science in the field. A Portuguese conservator and I were not able to join the 2022 field team due to travel snafus. Over my four weeks in the field in 2019, the conservation lab evolved into this configuration. A central bench and folding tables are in the middle of the gear. Along the walls are other work areas and storage for conservation supplies and artifacts. Storage of artifacts in process and packed artifacts was an ongoing issue, especially accommodating many large damp textiles that needed to be stored flat. Looking east, where I am doing a textile treatment on the central bench. You can see more use of the roof poles for storage and examples of the volume of textile scraps. Our Mongolian archaeological and ethnographer colleagues are all very handy and constructed shelves for the central bench to create more storage space. Here, Chuka is using the back of an axe as a hammer, Biamba is seated, and Oguna is smiling in the back. Here is the central bench with shelves holding large textiles and the ersatz shelf we made under a folding table. Note how everything is covered with plastic sheeting. The roof of the gear is water resistant, but not immune to drips, so it was crucial to keep everything covered. Also note the Tyvek that we rolled around a gear pole. Tyvek was a very important material for preventive care of the salvaged collection. Views to the south. The left image shows the main bench with me pinning a humidified textile and the southeast bench in background. The right image shows the southeast bench where I am cleaning metal fragments our solar panel wiring, and empty crate storage. Views to the west. The back of the left image shows how we stored DSLR cameras and a portable photo stand for small objects. In the right photo, Sandra is teaching students how to handle larger archaeological textiles. The red circle and P highlights our set of 5x7 paper cards where we wrote out protocols for different materials. We also stored our inventory cards this way to create a paper record alongside the digital registration we created on tablet computers. Our supplies of archival plastic bags were limited, so we also reused the scrap plastic sheeting that came around the new storage crates to create humidity chambers and protect artifacts from dripping water. The photos on the left shows packed artifacts along the north wall and a large textile on the central bench. On the right, Sandra is performing photo documentation just inside the gear door, a practice we used on days that were either too rainy, too windy, or too sunny. We also stored our artifacts management kits and various archaeology tools just inside the, the lab gear door. Now let's dive into materials and issues at Horig. These burials of powerful Mongol nobility of the Yuan dynasty were preserved in permafrost for much of the last 800 years. Our goals in the field were to clean and stabilize artifacts, then pack them for the three-day drive to the National Museum of Mongolia for deposition. After looting, the artifacts and remains were exposed to the elements for a few years before our salvage excavation. The mountain weather at Horig is changeable and often extreme. During field work, we experience frequent rain, hail, and gale force winds. Condition issues included soiling, biodeterioration, photo degradation, freeze-saw cycles, mechanical damage, delamination, and disassociation. Many artifacts were recovered damp and humidity management was a big challenge. Our salvage triage goals centered around managing moisture to prevent deterioration from microorganisms. We also addressed dimensional distortion at the macro level in organics like birch bark and fiber breakdown at the micro level in textiles. A side note before I focus on artifacts conservation. When I presented this talk, the audience asked questions about deposition of human remains. Contemporary ethics places decision-making power with descendant communities to determine culturally appropriate practices for ancestral remains. Extractive collecting and archaeology in the 19th and 20th centuries transferred substantial amounts of Mongolian cultural heritage to collections outside of Mongolia.
Nomad Science worked closely with Mongolian cultural heritage authorities to make decisions about salvage collection and deposition at this important site. Contemporary Mongolian stakeholders chose to pursue collection at Horig for preservation within Mongolia, as well as scientific analysis of remains and artifacts. Our team's field protocols for human remains are to handle bones with respect and care and to prevent physical damage and disassociation. After completing our salvage excavation, we filled each burial pit with earth and placed the cairn stones back into a pile on top of the empty graves to resemble its appearance before looting. Remains and artifacts were deposited in the National Museum of Mongolia in Ulaanbaatar for preservation and study. Several artifacts from Horig are now shared with the public in the Chinggis Khan National Museum in Ulaanbaatar. At Horig, conservators often performed and trained students in the role of artifacts management. At the cemetery, we salvage multiple graves every day. The artifacts manager is responsible for sorting material on site by grave, by material, and whether it was recovered in the grave pit or on the surface. At end of workday, the artifact manager collaborates on packing artifacts and remains for hand transport through the larch forest to our vans to return to the field camp. During the second session with a large number of students, we organized multiple artifacts management stations. This role could be stressful. It was also critical to reduce the risk of further disassociation. Our professional conservators and archaeologists supported student artifacts managers learning how to handle fragile artifacts, especially textiles. We began our archaeological work on site by moving all the disturbed stones and sifting all soil down to the grass level, then excavated in the pit down to the bottom of the coffin when present. We took many photos but did not document specific locations of artifacts on the surface, as it would teach us about the looters, not the ancestors buried there. We discovered several large ceramics buried in the grave walls that the looters missed, including this beautiful, very heavy jar that turned out to be full of urum, which is similar to butter. Later research on this jar identified a wick, signifying that this jar functioned as a lantern. My role in the conservation lab gear was essentially to be an intern. I received a crash course in using data loggers to monitor humidity. Most textiles were recovered damp with biological activity and freezing services were not available off the grid. Sandra had a set of Tyvek silica channel sleeves custom made in Ulaanbaatar and we used bulk silica beads. During the second session, Sandra collaborated with an Australian student to devise a method to reset silica beads above the stove in the kitchen gear. My first task was creating a system of coroplast trays sized to the storage crates purchased for Nomad Science with grant money. This tray system was inspired by Sandra's work at the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum, where she expanded on a system implemented by Lucy Commoner. The modular system Sandra and I developed in the field was limited by the size of coroplast sheets we could ship to Mongolia, storage space in the lab gear, and the inner dimensions of our transport vehicles. The designs I made incorporated buffer space in the crate for padding and sub-trays that stacked side by side. After my initial successes with the trays, Sandra asked me to build her a large box to house large textiles. I used my tray formulas to calculate the largest box and lid I could create with our coroplast sheets. Charlotte Parent taught me how to use acetone or ethanol to desiccate archaeological iron to stabilize horse stirrups. They were later packed in small crates with silica sachets and Tyvek pillows stuffed with polyfill fibers. I learned several techniques with Tyvek and foam to create storage solutions. All our enclosures needed to function as permanent housings as the National Museum of Mongolia has limited resources for collections care. On the left are a set of Tyvek sleeves I made for iron projectile points. On the right is a recessed housing constructed from foam covered in Tyvek, made for a gold artifact in the shape of a lobed moon. Our team had neither space nor time to clean and flatten all the large textiles we recovered at Horig. This large textile fragment is part of a traditional Mongolian robe called a del that was buried with an elite woman. This dell, embroidered with golden, five-clawed dragons, needed a soft housing that could stack atop other artifacts in a crate for transport. Sandra coached me to adapt a four-flap rare book housing method from paper conservation to our needs in the field. The housing was sewn with lifting handles on the ends, labeled Lift Here in Mongolian and English. Here I demonstrate opening the housing. The robe fragment is laid atop a separate piece of Tyvek inside the housing, 
so it can be moved safely out of the housing. Managing the many small, damp textile fragments that had been shredded by field mice was a significant challenge. Sandra trained me to use trays and silica gel in crate enclosures to accelerate the drying process. The conservation literature argues this will reduce unwanted changes and deterioration. After the fragments were dry and risks of handling were lower, I surveyed and sorted them. It was important to identify and separate fragments with important guiding elements like stitching that would support later reconstruction of the whole. Midway through the session, Sandra suggested I choose a small textile to clean and flatten. I selected a fragment with a cloud design, a complex weave fabric with possible metals in the fibers. Sandra taught me to remove rootlets with microsnips and use an air puffer and wood skewers to gently dislodge dirt. She taught me how to use coroplast, cheesecloth, and Tyvek to create a humidity chamber in a large plastic bag to allow the creases to soften so I could gently press them down with gloved fingertips. On the left, I am using insect pins to aid in flattening the humidified textile. I then allowed it to dehumidify in a silica enclosure. However, the treatment was less successful than expected, with persistent rippling in some areas of the fragment. Sandra discussed this with me and asked if I would like to participate in her ongoing research on moisture remediation. When preparing for fieldwork at Horig, Sandra anticipated that moisture remediation would be the highest risk for textiles. Unfortunately, the literature is very quiet on how to handle this issue in low infrastructure settings. To begin addressing this information vacuum, Sandra carried out trial observations with conservation colleagues before going to the field and obtained permission to do field experiments with ex excess fragments that did not contain guiding elements. For our experiment, I selected a set of six shredded fragments of a complex weave textile from the same grave for the first trial. For the second trial, we used fragments of contemporary silk Sandra brought for this purpose. On the left is the equipment we used. Coroplast, cheesecloth, Tyvek, polyester thread, a psychrometer, insect pins, and digital calipers. On each fragment, I sewed benchmarks using an AATCC method from the conservation literature. Since we did not know what direction of the archaeological silk was warp or weft, we oriented in the direction of patterning, indicated by a double-ended arrow on a paper label. On the contemporary silk with selvage, we noted the warp direction directly on the fabric. The first step was to humidify the fragments. I wetted cheesecloth in filtered water and laid it on a sheet of coroplast, then covered the damp cheesecloth in Tyvek. Fragments were laid on the board, and the board was enclosed in a large archival plastic bag with a data logger. Half of the samples were flattened in a silica enclosure and the other half in ambient air. We tested flattening with weight, with pins, and with no intervention. On the left are the six archaeological samples humidifying. On the right, three samples are dehumidifying. Note that the bag of soil used as a weight is placed on the outside of the enclosure. We aborted our initial trial when we realized a soil bag inside the enclosure was not completely sealed and leaked moisture. Before and after the flattening and dehumidifying treatment, I measured the distances between the stitched benchmarks with digital calipers and recorded the results. I then repeated the experiment with fragments of contemporary silk. As expected, the air-dried controls shrank the most, and acceleration by silica gel alone impeded shrinkage a little. The flattening methods with and without silica showed inconsistent outcomes between archaeological and contemporary silk, as well as shrinkage, as well as between shrinkage and the warp and weft. Comparing an archaeological compound twill textile with metal fibers to a plain weave contemporary textile is not ideal. However, we worked with the supplies we had. We can improve on the accuracy and usefulness of these preliminary investigations by tightening up our protocol and sourcing more test subjects. Further experiments will expand our collective knowledge of the drying behavior of archaeological textiles and accessible interventions. A joint poster by Sandra and I presenting our results was accepted to NATCC, but postponed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. To close, I want to share a preview of part two of this series of talks on field conservation in Northern Mongolia. My experiences in the Darkad Valley with Nomad Science has taught me how much conservation work is possible with relatively limited resources. I successfully applied for an ACMS Field Research Fellowship 
to research preventative conservation practices among Mongolian herders and cultural heritage professionals working in the field. The core of this research will be ethnographic interviews with Darhad herders about how they pack and load their family treasures on trucks or animals for their seasonal moves and learn about their conservation needs to raise awareness on how their needs could be better met. It is traditional to bring gifts on Gare visits, so I will bring gift packets of archival photograph and document sleeves to support these households' preservation needs. I will also survey cultural heritage professionals on the Nomad Science team about preventive conservation solutions they use in the remote setting, setting of the Darkhad Valley. The approaches of herder families and cultural heritage professionals to preventive conservation in the field will then be considered an intersection. This research is relevant to households around the world as societies respond to 21st century climate change. Care of household collections during seasonal and climate migration moves can all benefit from accessible, material appropriate, and locally sourced supplies for transportation and storage of objects. The results of this research will be presented as part two at a future WAC conference. Thank you to WAC leadership for organizing the 2022 WAC meeting in my home city of Seattle and WAC President Geneva Griswold for her support as I readied my first conference presentation. Thank you to all my professional and peer mentors for their teaching and encouragement. Thank you to Nomad Science and my field mentors, especially Sandra Vanderwarf for constructive criticism that improved this talk. Thank you to my friends and my family.